Otto Bird here, discussing with you the liberal arts, their history, and philosophy. We've considered the linguistic arts of the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And this time we're beginning to discuss the mathematical arts of the quadrivium. Now among the signs used to obtain knowledge through those of mathematics, there's the signs occupy a special place. In fact, uh, the signs used in mathematics constitute a language which is in many respects extraordinary. So extraordinary there are times when mathematics itself appears to be no more than a language. These times are transient. Since the knowledge achieved in mathematics can be distinguished from the means used to achieve and express it. What the objects of this knowledge the object of this knowledge is constitutes a difficult question. Fortunately, it need not detain us since it is possible and useful to consider the signs used in mathematics without raising the question of the nature and status of its objects. Mathematical signs are especially important to any consideration of the liberal arts as arts of signs. They compel us in the first place to distinguish among various kinds of signs. So far in discussing the general nature of signs and the arts of their use, it has been possible to assume the distinction and leave it more or less explicit, implicit. But in comparing the mathematical arts with ordinary language, some distinctions between the kinds of sun, signs become imperative, and this can further the understanding of signs themselves and the arts of their use. Such a consideration also provides us with an occasion for raising the question of the historical inclusion of mathematics among the, among the liberal arts. As we have seen in considering their history, the arts of the quadrivium are the mathematical arts as distinguished from the linguistic arts of the trivium. I have been arguing that there must be at least three liberal arts when understood as arts of signs, and that these three correspond to the linguistic arts of the trivium. The question can now be raised whether there are more than these three, and particularly whether mathematics makes it necessary to extend the list as the tradition holds. On a theory of the liberal arts as the arts of signs, I see no need for any extension outside the arts of signs themselves, I hope to show that the arts of signs employed in mathematics are fundamentally the same as the linguistic arts that we have already met. But what differences there are arise from the differences in the kinds of signs that are used and in the objects on which they are used. Now mathematics is a language in the sense that it is a structure of signs and symbols. It's also much more than that. But it is at least this much. Indeed, one of the difficulties in learning mathematics lies in mastering the language. To a beginner, a mathematical paper appears as an array of strange and meaningless signs that provide a shock in which there is no shock of recognition for a long while. Many, after discouraging, discouraging and futile attempts to come to grips with it, have abandoned the effort with the excuse that they do not possess a mathematical mind. Yet the perfection, even the beauty of its language, constitutes one of the highest claims advanced for mathematics. Such extremes of disgust and delight raise the suspicion that there is something peculiar and special about this language. Something of this peculiarity becomes evident from even a cursory in inspection of a simple example. In classical plane geometry, the theory named after Pythagoras as its discoverer and placed by Euclid at the end of his first book of elements states that in right angle triangles, the square on the sides subtending the right angle is equal to the squares on the sides containing the right angle. And that's what we have drawn here. See a right angle triangle with squares drawn on 
the line B making B square on A making A square on C making C square. And the proof of it We employ a diagram of right angled triangle with squares on its sides, the parts of it which may de be designated with letters. If we call the side opposite right angle C and the other two sides A and B, we can with some further suppositions express the theorem in the form that C square equals A square plus B square. So as yes, you know. Considering only this much and laying aside for the moment the assumption that makes possible this form of expression, we at once note certain differences from the practice of our ordinary speech. We have diagrams, as you see, letters instead of names, uh, numbers written in Arabic notation, in the expression C squared, the squares being the numbers, a sign for expressing the operation of addition, and another for expressing equality. None of these signs, or even words for them, appear with much frequency in ordinary speech. Yet each of these is a sign, since it, may no it makes known something other than itself. And furthermore, they not only differ from ordinary speech, but they differ from one another. There are different kinds of signs, the diagram being one kind of sign, the letters, and the uh, addition and equal signs being other kinds of signs. Now of these various signs, the least is the, the least complex is the letter designating a side of the triangle, A, B, or C. As a sign, it functions very differently from any of the others. The diagram, numerals, the signs of equality and addition present an object. They have a meaning. The letters only refer or denote and as such, do not mean or connote anything. We fasten them to the sides of the triangle and use them as proper names to indicate or refer to its sides, A, B, and C. A direct connection is established, as it were, between the sign and the object, which functions in much the same way that pointing does. See, uh, I point to the triangle, well, the uh, uh, letters, see, accomplish the pointing too. For this reason, it's good to call this kind of sign a pointing sign or an index, indexical signs. Now, what's the advantage of an indexical sign? Well, it makes possible a considerable economy in expression. See, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Very few, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight signs, whereas you put it in words, you got a lot more than that. Perhaps even more important, they eliminate ambiguity in reference. See, A, B, and C, each of them designate one side and only one side of that triangle. Designating the two legs of the triangle by different letters, we can always refer to one of them without any doubt about which one is being indicated. The letters serve as proper names or relative pronouns, establish an unambiguous connection with their objects. Because of this virtue, letters are frequently used to clarify ambiguities that arise in verbal discourse. C.S. Peirce, the great American semiotician, the greatest of American philosophers, though he died in 1914, cites the following example from a grammarian as a case of a verbal ambiguity, difficulty to avoid with words. Here it is in words. One man said to another that he thought his brother more unjust to himself than to his own friend. Now, where's the ambiguity? It arises because the pronouns, his, may refer to any one of three persons. But such ambiguity is readily avoided by assigning letters to the three persons and using the letters instead of the pronouns. We then have A 
said to his brother, said to be, that he Now this is ambiguous. So is the he refer to A or B? That he thought his which one again? But his brother, C, more unjust to himself, A, B, C, then to his own friend. A's, B's, C's. Now you see with the letters, you can avoid the ambiguity. Now. A said to B that he, let's suppose it's A, A thought his, A's, brother, C, more unjust to himself, to C, let us say, than to his, C's, own friend. Now, you see the advantage of uh, the use of letters. Of course, uh, the use of letters is not confined to mathematics. It's also used by lawyers. It may be used in discourse whenever it is necessary to indicate unmistakably which one of several things is being referred to. Of course, this is not the only use of letters in mathematics, but this is one of the clearest examples of the indexical sign. Um, other uses involve different kinds of signs even when an indexical element is present. Sometimes a letter may be no more than an abbreviation for a longer expression. So in the diagram of the triangle, we might use H as the abbreviation for side subtending the right angle, which in Greek is hypotenuse. More important of all, letters are used for variables, thus to express the algebraic identity that the product of the difference and the sum of any two integers is equal to the differences of their squares. To write it in letters is very, very easy. It makes it very, very clear. We've been considering the indexical sign, the signs that indicate or point to the objects they're about. Now take the, take the algebraic expression that x minus y multiplied by x plus y equals x squared minus y squared. Now, the x's and the y's are indexical signs, uh, but we have to know something more. They stand for integers, for whole numbers. So, in this case, there's more than a simple indication of an element. For the letter to function as the sign of a variable, this additional knowledge must be available. It is produced by the sign, through the sign, because x and y are used to stand for integers, for whole numbers. Now this is a conventional association, see, that it's agreed among us mathematicians that these letters x and y, as used in this expression, are to be filled in by whole numbers. And that reveals the presence of another kind of sign. See, the uh, A, B, and C of the triangle indicate the sides of the triangle. Uh, X and Y indicate 
something indicate numbers, but we must know that it's limited to whole numbers. Uh, writing the, uh, making the diagram of the triangle and labeling the signs A, B, and C indicate, identify at once the letters with the triangle. That X and Y stand for numbers we have to know in addition, something else. See, it's a conventional sign in that case. We agree now, in this case, to use the X and Ys. The first and most obvious character, and our diagrams, of course, are signs, but the first and most obvious characteristic of a diagram as a sign lies in the fact that it contains a likeness of the object it signifies. A, B, C, X, Y, nothing in the signs themselves is like what they're signs of. The triangle drawn on the board is an image of the triangle itself. A streak made with pencil or chalk is as a length. It's a likeness of a geometrical line. The triangle drawn on the board is a likeness of the geometrical triangle. It's only a likeness, of course. A geometrical triangle is a two-dimensional figure, but there's a layer of chalk on the board there, making it a three-dimensional figure. Some words obviously attempt to present an auditory likeness of their object. See, the buzzing of bees in English is an example. See, the bees are supposed to sound like the sound buzz. And yet this verbal sign succeeds in functioning only because an association has also been established between the sound that we make and the sound of the insect. And this association is the work of, of human convention or agreement. Bees do not buzz in all languages. In, in German, they don't buzz, they zoomen. In French, they bourdon. It's only in English that they buzz. In possessing some likeness with their object, these, this kind of signs uh, share with the mathematical diagram a certain character as signs. Peirce's name of them as icon is a good one. An icon is a, a picture, a likeness. And it's a likeness now with its object. This fact that there is a likeness with its object distinguishes the iconic sign from the index, which just points. Uh, it establishes, as it were, a dynamic connection with the object that it's about. Also from these signs in which the connection between sign thing and object is conventional. English, German, and French words used for the sound of bees differ in belonging to different linguistics, linguistic conventions belonging to different languages. The association of certain sounds as sign things with certain objects is a work of human imposition. See, it's the English-speaking group that call that buzzing insect a bee. Most words are of this sort. We need a name for, uh, for this kind of sign now, a third kind of sign, where the meaning is contained in the imposition by human agreement that bees, that <laughs> in English the insect is a bee, and that a bee buzzes. See, that's by human agreement. And so, uh, this third kind of sign is well called a symbol. Unfortunately, the word symbol has come to have many different uses, and so its value is somewhat questionable. However, if we give it a, uh, a distinct and separate meaning from an indexical sign that points, a iconic sign that images, and think of a symbolic sign or a symbol as a conceptualizing sign, we'll have no, no trouble. The special utility of the iconic sign lies in the way in which it can be taken for the object itself and subjected to observation and experimentation. You work on the sign things now. With words, no amount of juggling will yield any information that we don't already possess of the things they signify. Analysis of the word man altering its parts, its letters, shows nothing about the rational animal that it names. But from the icon, there is much to be learned about the object itself, 
as is evident from the use of the diagram in mathematics. The Pythagorean theorem provides a simple illustration. To prove it, we start with a right angle triangle, as on the, as on the board there, and with the sides A, B, and C, and C the hypotenuse. So to prove that they're equivalent, see, we draw the, the squares on the sides and then start experimenting. See, uh, now the squares, uh, not, uh, it's not necessary that the figures drawn on the three sides of the triangle always be squares. So long as they're any similar kind of figure, it's going to make the point uh, and show the uh, equivalence that's involved here. Suppose we uh, take a much simpler case now and take our triangle here, another right angle triangle, and draw the diagonal so that we have two right angle triangles. And now draw equivalent triangles on all three sides. See, and if we do that, here we have the right angle triangle, and we draw the whole triangle over here on this side. Uh, this going down the diagonal over here on side B, and the smaller one down here below. Now how can we experiment with this? Well, we can, the whole triangle over here, equal to the whole triangle, it's the same, so we have folded out of the way, see? And now, what can we do with these other triangles uh, drawn on the other sides? Well, suppose that we have the one triangle drawn on that side and the little triangle at the bottom. Now, how can we show that those two triangles are equal to the whole triangle? Well, we can invert so as to have that triangle there and turn around and have that triangle there and we've recovered our original triangle. Now, however awkward this illustration is, the point should be clear. We are operating upon the sign thing itself. See, this is an iconic sign of that triangle on which we draw the triangles on the sides. And then we can experiment, see, as we've done in this very crude and simple fashion. From this simplified version, we can see that the triangle and the, and the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of those on the two sides, if we did it with our original one. This doesn't constitute a proof. It does provide visual or intuitive evidence for the truth of the theorem. For rational proof of it, we would need to prove the similarity of the triangles, which would in turn involve proving many other theorems. This is a good example of uh, mathematical reasoning in illustrating generalization, specialization, and analogy. We have generalized in passing from the squares described on the original triangle to any kind of similar figures on the sides as we drew triangles on the triangle in the second case. Uh, we then also specialized in reducing, see, the uh, problem to the triangles alone, uh, moving from squares to triangles. And then we have an analogy, since we can go from that and say that uh, any similar figures drawn on the sides of the triangle will be equal. All of this, in all of this, of course, we are reasoning. But we are reasoning with the help of diagrams or iconic signs. Furthermore, the icons have been different kinds. Geometrical Democrats, 
<laughs> Geometrical diagrams are iconic. So too are the algebraic expressions used to designate the areas of the figures in the expressions of the Pythagorean theorem in its generalized form. An icon, the drawing of a triangle on the board, the squares drawn on the sides. Icons, because they're likenesses, see, of what we're talking about, triangles and squares and their relations. But the algebraic expression, c squared equals a squared plus b squared, that's also an icon, but we usually don't think of it as icon because the, the symbolic or conventional character is so strong in it. See, the c, the, the notion of squaring, for example, uh, is uh, a conventional sign, and we have to know what we mean by squaring. See, when it's applied not to drawing a square on the side of a triangle, but to express a relation that holds, in this case, between the squares that are drawn. But what's more, what's iconic about that algebraic expression apart from the diagram? Well, it manifests the relation in the way that the diagram does not. The diagram, drawn as such, does not exhibit the equality of the squares on the sides being equal to the square on the hypotenuse. The algebraic expression of it, you have an equal sign that divides the sign, the whole sign, the expression, into two parts, saying that when the operation of addition is performed upon A and B, then the result is equal to that operation of squaring upon, uh, upon C. Now, the equal sign itself is an icon, see? Two equal lines, see? So it shows in itself that <laughs> the equal. Uh, the algebraic expression then See, uh, manifests, see, uh, more in this respect, more about the relation between the parts in the triangle than the diagram of the triangle does. Now, the algebraic expression is symbolic and indexical as well as iconic, see, but this is only to be expected since it is where to find only one kind of sign at work. The combination helps to increase the power of signs. However, uh, the greatest power of signs, of, uh, especially in the generalizing power, lies in the symbolic sign. Now let's see how that's the case. In locating and isolating the iconic and the indexical sign, we have found it necessary to consider only the diagram which accompanies the statement of the Pythagorean theorem. Even so, we have not been able to avoid entirely reference to the symbolic or conventional sign. Now this kind of sign, the symbolic, becomes a predominant concern in making a general statement. The Pythagorean theorem makes such a statement. See? The squares on the square on the hypotenuse is equal to some of the squares of the other two sides of a right angle triangle. A statement in English. However, that statement holds not only for this diagram on the board, it holds for all right angle triangles. See? In other words, it expresses a generality, a universal. And that is expressed through the sign is the work of the symbol and of neither index nor icon. The diagram is a picture of one particular triangle. The algebraic expression in which the letters appear as indices of the triangle's sides is a description of that triangle. But we take both of them as standing for or representing 
any triangle of this sort. Furthermore, with only a little algebra, we might not restrict the equation to geometry, but allow the a, b, and c to be indices for numbers. And then it expresses the property that when you square a number, the square of one number can equal the square of two other numbers. This expresses a different thing from the Pythagorean theorem. It's a theorem in arithmetic. This sense, the algebraic expression possesses greater ge generality than the geometrical diagram because the, ge the algebraic statement expresses the truth both of geometry and of arithmetic. Yet, in both cases, the notion that the sign stands for any element of a certain sort, for any triangle, for any whole numbers, see, that fact is the work neither of icon nor index, but of the symbol, the symbol being a result of what its users have agreed to mean by it. It has been established so to be, it's not given, by either the index or the icon. At most, the indexical signs functions as a proper name. The, ex the iconic sign is a particular picture having some likeness with its object. Each is a particular. See? That the particular can present the general constitutes a further achievement, which is a work of a distinct kind of sign, that is, of the symbol or sign with conventional imposition. An icon, in other words, see, uh, is an illustration. It's not just a likeness. Any illustration that we uh, provide in the course of trying to manifest something is preventing a likeness that enables us to establish a relation uh, to what it is that we're talking about. Of course, any kind of a sign is a class capable of having, having many, many members. The, our diagram of the Pythagorean theorem is a picture of one triangle. The letter A, the sign of a particular vowel sound. Yet each of these can be copied and multiplied many, many times. There are as many copies of the diagram in figure one as there are presentations of this lecture. The vowel sound A can be represented as well in as many ways there are of saying the letter A or forming the written letter A. Both cases, the many instances are only so many different tokens of one sign. See, uh, we might say that this A, written here, a singular, a particular, is a token of a type. What's the type? The letter A. Uh, so that every copy of it, see, are only so many different tokens of that type so that we are in the use of, of letters, in the use of our words, see, are dealing with generalities, with universals, all the time. Even, even you see, when we tie ourselves down to a single diagram. Now, the greatest generality of this symbolic sign appears most clearly when uh, we remove it from uh, geometry, from arithmetic, and remove it from any particular interpretation and consider only certain elements and operations upon those elements. Now, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. There are three elements, a, b, and c. There's an operation performed upon them, indicated here by the twos. There's a relation established, or another operation performed upon two of them that establishes a relation to the third one. Now, we applied the C, A, and B, or interpreted them, as applying to the triangles or to whole numbers. Let's free them. 
They don't, they can stand for anything you want. See? Uh, what we're going to talk about and what we are concerned with is the operations and the relations that are established. So we're going to uh, analyze those relations and see what operations we can perform upon them and see what results we can achieve from performing those operations. Now the operations themselves will have to be defined, but the elements need not be defined, see, until we want to, an interpretation of them, see. So in that way, we get, uh, construct a formal system. No material elements are identified until you come to interpret it, but what you do establish is a formal structure uh, with many interrelations, the, uh, relations that can be formulated uh, and proven. And thus we get a general symbolic structure capable of many, many different interpretations, see, of which you can draw many, many different models. There's the very greatest generality that can be achieved, and it's the achievement possible, for us anyway, uh, in this earth now, only in mathematics. That's and this kind of formal system in logic and mathematics uh, explains why it can be said that mathematics never knows what it's talking about. <laughs> Meaning that A, B, and C can be anything you want. What mathematics is concerned with is with the relations among such elements and it's the relations and the patterns they perform that are the important things. The expression is a con uh, such as this algebraic expression is a complex sign in which indexical, iconic, and symbolic elements may be distinguished. The letters are indices of the elements on which the operations are performed. The operational and relational signs are conventional or symbolic, uh, meaning they're identify, uh, uh, defined, and the whole expression is an icon of the relation that results when we perform these two operations upon our elements so as to obtain a third. However, the equation as a whole, including the letters in it, constitutes a general statement of what may be done with any elements of the sort. See to be susceptible to the operations indicated, whatever they may be. And in, thus, in this, it is a symbolic sign, or better, a symbolic structure. We've distinguished the indexical sign, the iconic, and the symbolical sign. In many cases, the, in mathematics, and the use of their signs, it's the iconic that is dominant. Mathematicians sometimes claim that their language is superior to other languages and that it saves thought by doing their thinking for them. <coughs> Whitehead, for example, the mathematician and philosopher, contrasts what he calls substitutive signs with words and adopts as his own this statement of a previous author. A word is an instrument for thinking of the meaning which it expresses. A substitutive sign is a means of not thinking of the meaning which it symbolizes. Whitehead explains a substitutive sign as being such that in thought it takes the place of that for which it is substituted, with the result that we think about the sign itself and not its object. <coughs> In the use of ordinary verbal language, we usually think about the objects signified, not about the words themselves. Thus, there is always the danger of connecting the words with the wrong object. This danger would no longer exist if it were possible to consider only the sign and not bother about its object, only the sign thing. The substitutive sign would thus be able to serve thought, to save thought and serve it, not only by economizing it, but also by eliminating the great danger of ambiguity and equivocation. This is acknowledged by mathematicians when they praise their language as intuitive.
By this they mean that their language or sign structure manifests in itself the property that they are talking about. It possesses a likeness with its subject. Thus, uh, one mathematician, for example, claims that the most basic departure of mathematics from ordinary language consists in the use of parentheses to indicate groupings and of variables to make cross-references. Parentheses, of course, are iconic signs. And when we state a law, such as our Pythagorean law, that c squared equals a squared plus b squared, See, the, we could, and do in thought, uh, put parentheses around the addition of b squared and c squared, see, to indicate that they're to be added together. And then the equal sign indicates the relation to c. Uh, parentheses, in other words, uh, provide an actual likeness of groupings. They group and hold together their elements, separate from each other. The variables in this case, c squared equals a squared plus b, are indices indicating the elements being associated. And the whole expression is a substitutive sign, as Whitehead says, or an icon, as we've been calling it, since the law is fully manifested in the expression. See, b and c are first taken together or associated on one side, and then uh, equated as equal to the C on the other. Mathematics has developed and perfected the use of the iconic sign above all others. Of course, it has to use other signs as well. Without the index, the indexical sign, it could not particularize. Without the symbol, it could not generalize. Of the three, the symbol is undoubtedly the most important, even in mathematics. But with these qualifications, it can still be said that mathematics differs from other languages in the use and exploitation of the iconic sign. The importance of the iconic sign in mathematics helps us to explain why mathematical knowledge is sometimes identified with imagination and the constructible. Its signs are constructs that may be readily imagined. See, as we it can imagine a triangle and picture it by drawing a diagram of it. The great French mathematician, Adamar, claimed that in thinking about numbers, he always imagined patterns of points. See, uh, numbers he pictured as points. Uh, Peirce, the American philosopher, thought such a procedure so characteristic that he named mathematics diagrammatic thinking. Since for many purposes, nothing more than the signs as things need be thought of, may even be claimed that there is nothing more. Mathematics is then identified with the character of its signs and becomes a game of signs. However, this constitutes an interpretation of the object of mathematics, and it is by no means the only one compatible with recognition of the iconic character of its language. It is, this interpretation is the most radical, that it makes the likeness between sign and object one of identity, with the result that the distinction between the two becomes trivial. However, there's no need to go to such lengths to recognize the importance of the iconic in mathematical thinking. See, the philosophical problem involved is uh, whether the objects, the sign objects of mathematics, are merely the sign things that they work with, in which case mathematics is interpreted as nothing but a game of signs and is not about anything but the signs and tells us nothing about reality. That's the positive for or strongly positivist or, or strongly limited character of mathematical objects. On the platonic side, the realm of mathematics is an ideal world of reality and more real than this uh, moving world and contingent world in which we live. However, those are matters of uh, the philosophy of mathematics, the interpretation of the objects that it works upon and with. The dominance of the iconic sign, however, also illuminates the claim that mathematics is somehow more natural 
than our ordinary conventional language. This claim, as we have seen, underlines the traditional division between trivium and quadrivium. Thus, we've seen that the linguistic arts of the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, can be thought of as merely verbal arts, whereas the arts of the quadrivium are dealing with the nature of things. And yes, they are more natural. They're not merely verbal. See, they're reaching beyond words and signs to the realities beyond them. The determining quality of the iconic sign, however, which differentiates it from all others, consists in the presence in the sign thing of some character that is the same as its object. The drawing of a triangle is itself a three-sided figure, whereas the word triangle possesses nothing in shape like its object, though in sound it has three syllables, triangle. But we don't think of that when we say triangle, do we? Whereas you picture the diagram of a triangle, you see it's three-sided. Parentheses are brackets of themselves grouped together certain marks on a page. Whereas the sounds, although grouped together, do not of themselves perform, perform the function of grouping that we describe with the word group. The words accomplish their sign function through a conventional association which they have received. Mathematical icons do so through the likeness that they possess with their objects. Mathematical icons, however, are not natural signs, such as smoke is a natural sign of fire or the footprint uh, of the animal that made it. In these cases, there is a natural connection between the sign and its object. See, it's fire that makes the smoke. It's an animal that left its, its footprint in the mud. But in the diagram of the tri triangle, or in the groupings of the algebraic equation, the object does not make the sign. Rather, one character is selected from the object, and a likeness of it is produced in other matter. In chalk marks on the board, for example, those marks then being used as a sign of the object under consideration. Furthermore, the interpretation of the sign differs in the two cases. The case of a natural sign, we cannot read or interpret the footprint precisely unless we know the animal that makes such a mark. So what is needed is knowledge of the world. Uh, a fossilized footprint in, uh, in, a, in a mountainside, in a stone, is a sign of the animal that made it. See, But uh, uh, to know what animal made it, it's only a virtual sign until someone comes along who actually knows that it, uh, what animal it is the footprint of. <laughs> Can't read that interpret it until we know the animal that made the mark. And that demands knowledge of the world. Interpretation of mathematical signs depends upon the way that they are used. And this use is, is conventional. An algebraic expression is an icon of a general structure, the elements of which may be interpreted as either real numbers or lines, and so yield a theorem in arithmetic or geometry, which are results which results depend on the interpretation of the elements. Yet, in possessing a likeness with their object, icons are more natural than any other artificial sign. This likeness provides a common bond. For in finding the number of an aggregate of things, finding the number of an aggregate of things, we do find a property that is more natural than the artificial name we use for it. See, we discover that our flower has five petals. That's a natural fact about the flower. The ordinal relation among numbers corresponds in some way to a property of the things, so that counting can be defined as establishing a one-to-one -one correspondent between the elements of the aggregate and the nat natural integers. And the names of things in ordinary language tell us more about the world, but they do so because of their associations with our experience. Mathematics, the iconic character of its language, 
enables the sign things themselves to speak and to manifest their object. It depends, demands relatively little experience of the world, since the language can provide much of the relevant experience by itself. In this, mathematics resembles poetry. So much then for our first discussion of mathematical science. Thank you.